Well, it's really going to start at ground zero. Do you want to foster? Here's your steps. You know, so I really start at the very beginning about finding an agency, filling out the application. And there's a lot of things to think about, even when you're saying, who do I want the agency to be that's going to represent me as a foster parent? And so I really go through all of that. I love love to talk about our experiences and, you know, when so-and-so crossed the threshold, this this happened, that happened, what we found on placement day. Here's some great ideas for what to do on day one, especially new foster parents. Let me tell you that very first placement comes in, that very first child, you are just knocking your knees together because you have no idea. Everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. Yet again, I get a chance to talk to another great author celebrating a new book that's in the works and someone who writes and shares and definitely has a lot of great things that can help you in your journey and your life. And I'm excited to have Lois on the podcast. I'm on her website, which is changing today. So it'll be different for you when you hear this. But right now, it's still a beautiful website. And Lois, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast and be a part of our our little family of authors here on Living in Next Chapter. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. Tell everybody where you are in this big world of ours, Lois. Currently, I live in Florida, but for your Canadian listeners, I uh, was born and grew up uh, in the Eastern Townships, which is probably about two hours east of Montreal, Quebec. Beautiful. So you are you are one of us up here in yes. Canada. Great. Awesome. I love that. But I've lost the accent, Did so I've got I've, I have the American accent now. <laughs> so is that graduated to American accent or lost the Canadian no. accent? Which one is that? I, I'm I'm not sure, but I love <laughs> hearing the Canadian accent. It sends me straight back to my growing up years. I surely I I miss Canada very much. So if I say sorry many times or a <laughs> or a boot instead of about, yeah, right, yeah, okay, all right. I'll try to throw those in to give you a little taste of home. That's great. Excellent. Awesome. That's good. Uh, tell us a little bit about your writing career, Lois. How did you? How does all this start for you? We have a lot of young authors that are listening. They're new to writing. They're looking okay. to you as inspiration. They they can't wait for the day that they're this close to having your book launch. It seems like a million miles away, but you're there. So whatever you can share with us, I think we would love to inspire these authors that are listening. Well, I certainly remember not long ago for me that it seemed like a million years away. Uh, My biggest thing that I've learned is just to not rush the process. I started writing probably in the month of January, and my hopes were that it would be in the market come May. And I woke up very quickly to how long it takes, especially... Um, if you have a full-time job or you're a mom like I am, it takes a lot of time to get a book written. And then um, all of the alpha and beta readers that help us just really get our words a little bit more polished. And then the editor, that's where my work is right now. Uh, I'm fortunate that my father is also an author and uh, an editor. So He's been helping me not only as a beta reader, but he'll be moving into the editing stage now too. So, so all of those things take time. It is a process that uh, I find very rewarding. I'm absolutely love to write. I've been a writer since I was in grade school, uh, entering competitions in grade school, and even uh, wrote an article about the Eastern Townships in Quebec. Uh, it was a Native American article and. Um, I won third place and got a TV interview in sixth grade. So things kind of took off from there. (laughs) A nice early start. That's amazing. Um, Yes. What are you learning about yourself as you follow your journey as an author? How are you becoming different in the process? Well, I'm learning that writing comes from just deep within my soul. Okay. It is something that I could be having a really rough day. And if I'm able to clear my mind from what's happening and sit down and and write, I can redeem everything that happened during the day. Just 
really it's something that um, people talk about getting in the zone and it's and that's completely true in my case that once I sit down and I've got that it, well it's never a blank page because I just write and write and write um, but I sit down and I get started I've just really learned that that is my happy place uh, just getting words out on paper is uh, or on the computer uh, is really what brings my heart a lot of joy. Nice. Um, what are you currently writing? What's your new book about? What are you writing about? Love to kind of talk about that a little bit as well. Well, I'm a foster parent, or I, I was. I'm now an adoptive parent. Nice. And what I write about is what I wish I knew before I had become a foster parent. Uh, so this particular book is really centered on helping people understand what is foster care. Now, granted, I'm writing about the American foster care system, um, but here in the United States, foster care is really only known for one thing, and that is how awful the system is. Um, and so I really want to take that uh, and and really flip the narrative and instead of focusing on the broken system, focusing on being a solution to that system. And so not everyone is called to be a foster parent, but everyone should be involved in caring for children who who um, have been misplaced from their homes, who are no longer with their birth or biological families. So my writing is really focused on um, talking about in, in three sections. The book is kind of in three sections. So the first section is about foster care. And what I do is I weave our entire story through uh, through the book as I'm also giving practical explanations, applications, guides. And what I've discovered in talking to people who have a curiosity about foster care is that they don't have a clue what happens during every step they just know, okay, step one, I've got to find an agency, but then what happens from there? And I was in that same boat. My husband and I were like, we just want to help kids. And it was really a sink or swim. And I really want to demystify it all. So I write about all of the steps in foster care, all of the things you might encounter, but I do it from a way that says, here's what we encountered. Here's what we walked through. Uh, so you kind of, the reader can kind of feel like they're walking with me, that I'm being a guide and a coach for them. Um, then I move into the adoption section uh, and adopting from foster care has a number of different, again, things that people are like, I had no idea I could do this or do that. And uh, it really walks the reader through once you have um, fostered a child that has become available for adoption, now what? What happens next? I want to adopt this child. What are the steps? How much is it going to cost me? What do I have to be present in court? All of these things. And so again, we've adopted four boys from foster care and each one of them is a different experience. They weren't all adopted at once. So I share all of our experiences, the highs, the lows, the joys, the sadness, and it all gets weaved in along with um, checklists and, you know, suggestions on make sure you do this or work with the attorney to do that. And finally, the third section is for those that aren't called to be a foster parent, it helps them see how they can be involved. Um, I have a big call to churches because I really believe that if every single church in America would step up, uh, we would not have a single foster care crisis. There would not be a single child that's out there waiting for a home, sitting in the office of a caseworker with no place to go. So that's what I cover in the third section of the book, uh, just really talking about how to support foster families, how to... What are the things that you can do? How to be a friend or a mentor to a child in foster care? And then, a, again, a call to churches. Here's how you can set up a foster program so that you can really raise up two or three families in your church and support them, really undergird the ministry that they're doing with these children and take some things off of their plate that... Um, 
would really help open up their time to spend loving, loving on children who really need it so very, very much. Does your book primarily focus on the parenting side of this, or does it also then encompass grandparents, aunts, uncles? Like, is it can it be more broadly expanded as well for other people in the family? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I do talk about kinship care, and that is anyone um, who is a family member. It could be that the birth family, the birth parents are not able to care for the child and have lost their parental rights, but maybe a grandmother or an aunt or even a teacher. Kinship care is not always biological. It can be someone close to the family that wants to step in and become a parent to that child. So I do cover all the different types of people from foster to kinship and what it all means. Kinship care is a big deal in, in the states right now as um, some states are really stepping up to give kinship placements, the people taking in their own kin, uh, to give them the same benefits that a foster parent would have. Uh, right now, or in a lot of states, I should say, um, grandparents or aunts or uncles or teachers might take in a child as a kinship placement, and they don't they don't get any of the benefits that a foster family would get. Um, not that you go into this for the benefits, but when you are taking in taking in children, it does help to have some of these uh, government programs that that help us in uh, in our journey. Well, okay. How long ago was it that you started this journey as a family to? to open your home in this very special way. When did this all start? Well, in 2011, my husband and I were married. And uh, in 2012, it was about eight months after we said, I do. Uh, we said that we will, we will become foster parents. Wow. And a lot of people said to us, no, put on the brakes, enjoy your time together. Um, but we were married later in life, and so we were we were just ready to jump in and help jump in and be people that um, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, but uh, we filled out that application, and we were just raring to go. We just wanted to love on kiddos. Yeah. So I anticipate you had a lot of conversations in those that first year together as you kind of ramped this up and go down this we path, did. right? So you want to both be on the same page with this, right? We do. Yeah. Any any couple wants to, but what we find is usually it's the wife or the woman who says, you know, I I really want to do this. And, and then her spouse or her partner will usually say, oh, wait a minute, this is big and scary. I don't understand it. Put on the brakes. Um, so what, what I found is if you can get like in my case, if I could get my husband to the meeting, it's not just me sharing. There's so much need. It's other people going, you know what? You you can really make a difference. And um, so, yes, a lot of couples get there and the husband sits there with his arms crossed and I want nothing, nothing to do with this, you know, and the wife is just soaking it all in. But that's sometimes the seed, you know, you plant that seed and then don't push it, let it grow. And um, usually if, if you're meant to be a foster parent, it will happen. It will happen. What's the community like for foster parents? Is there a way to network with each other and help and be supportive for other families that are fostering as well? That's one of the uh, reasons that I decided to really jump in and be an advocate for foster parents and adoptive parents because Right now, things are changing. The landscape is changing. But when I was fostering, it was extremely lonely. Uh, a foster parent encounters things with children that not everyone understands. If you have not been a foster parent or been around foster families, there are things that happen that just seem so crazy and a lot of people just don't don't get it. You know, it doesn't happen with your biological kids. You don't get dragged into court with your bio kids. You don't, you know, there's just so many things that go on that really make a foster parent feel like I am completely isolated and no one understands me. Um, 
So, for instance, I live in Florida. The state of Florida is really starting different programs where foster parents can uh, log in. They can get to know each other. Obviously, there's Facebook groups out and about that um, a lot of foster parents will start uh, in different counties, different cities. Um, But in large part, being a foster parent can be uh, a a lonely and isolating um, endeavor because you are just really pouring your life out and into these children. Yeah. I had a foster parent on my another podcast I host called Dad Space. And he's a, a foster dad, and he he shared little things that I wasn't aware of or didn't consider, like for example, wanting to do a family vacation and taking your foster children outside of the state. Yeah, you have to get permission for that. You can't just jump in the car and go for a road trip. You have to be sure you follow all the rules. And I'm like, oh wow, I didn't even think about that. So yeah. there's that's a whole another side of it, right? And then to go from fostering to adoption, um. I think that's such a special transition for for mm-hmm. parents to go through. But again, fostering can be a long, lengthy journey to become a foster parent. And then adoption can be another long journey as well to kind of work through the process for some people. For you guys, how was that journey? Was it fast or slow? Kind of tell us a little bit about the fostering and the adoption side. Well, our first son was already a ward of the state, uh, which is incredibly rare. He was only three years old, um, but already had uh, gone through a number of foster families. And by the time he landed on our doorstep a little after his third birthday, we were his sixth home that he had lived in. So his case was different because he was he was a placement that you would call straight adopt. Uh, so there's essentially three different types of placements. Um, one is just a, a regular placement. A child is removed. A home is found. A child is placed. Uh, there's then emergency placements that that is something that happens very, very quickly. Uh, and we have had an emergency placement where 11 o'clock at night, we got the call. They said they're removing the kids as we speak. Can we bring them by? And three kids got dropped off at almost midnight. Um, and then there's legal risk placements, which means that it looks like this child's case is heading toward the termination of parental rights, which let me just say, that's never our goal as foster parents. I don't jump in there and say, I hope I'm going to get to keep this child. No, no, no. These children are not meant to be our children. The best place is for them to be in a safe home preferably their birth and biological home. But that's not always a possibility. And so when it looks like uh, the parents are not following the service plan that has been set out for them to get a job, get clean, get sober, get a home, whatever it might be, if they are not following that and they have been given chance after chance, then that child's status in the foster care system becomes legal risk. Um, and a number of people go um, enjoy uh, fostering legal risk children, especially if they are wanting to adopt, because um, three of our boys were legal risk. We wanted to adopt. And so we got a call about them and they came to live with us. And their case took a long time, whereas my first son's case uh, took six months and one week. And so that's the rule. Since he was already an orphan and available for adoption, um, we have to foster for six months. And the main reason for this is because there is a huge rate of failed adoptions. And so they don't want to just place a child and the week after the gavel drops, he's your kid, you know, have fun. Uh, they really want to make sure that it's a, a a positive situation for both the child and the family. So we fostered Remy for six months. And we said we knew on, on day one, I mean, we were waiting for him to cross our threshold. We we're like, we don't have any care what what is going on in this child's life. We will be here. We will love him. We will be his parents. Bring him. And so uh, we did our six months and a week later, we, uh, we, we 
stood before the judge and adopted this little guy that uh, is my firstborn now. So for him, it was easy because his parental rights had already been terminated. Now, our second um, group was a sibling group of three, three boys. So we have four boys. Uh, and they uh, came, and it's a busy household. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so they came, but their parental rights had not yet been terminated, although they were considered legal risk because it looked like their case was going toward termination. Um, and so they came and they stayed. They were with us for almost a year, and. Um, we battled in court for them because the parents were not doing anything, but the court kept saying, okay, keep trying, keep trying and keep trying. And that, if I had to choose one thing that foster parents would say is the most frustrating thing, it is that this is not set in stone. You know, it's not like, okay, you get three months to do this. And at three months and one week, if you have not cleaned yourself up or, or worked your services, then Sorry, we're taking the child. It It is not like that. Um, typically, a, a foster or a family, a biological family who is um, who has had their child removed has 18 months to work their services. Now, that could vary state by state, but um, to my knowledge, 18 months is give or take is, is the norm. Uh, but parents get a lot of chances. And that's not bad on the parent side, because if a parent is truly working to get their uh, life in order so that they can have their children back, I'm all for saying, you know what, give them a little bit more time. That's okay. They show that they're really wanting to. But the reality is, if they have not in 18 months done really anything that's required of them by the court... Often the judge will continue to say, okay, we'll give you another six months or we'll give you another year. And that puts these poor children in such a limbo that they have no idea who's my family. I go years without knowing really who I'm going to belong to. And that's that's just a, a, a killer on the psyche. So our three boys... Um, their their family was was fighting and still not working services though, but they didn't want to let go of the kids. And I get it. I mean, it's heartbreaking. But at some point, the judge had to step in and say, "Okay, no, they they're they bonded to their current family, which was us, and it's time to just sever the ties." And it's truly it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because I was there in the courtroom when parental rights were terminated. And as a mom, I think, how on earth would I survive that? Not knowing where my babies are. They've been taken away from me. I don't know if they're well, they're sick, they're happy, they're sad. And I'm just, Mother's Day is actually a hard day. It's Mm. wonderful for me. But my thoughts are often on the mothers who birthed these beautiful boys that I now call my own. Well, that's a very interesting thought. I didn't put that together either. That's... Yeah, that can be quite sobering then to be thinking of them in this moment while you're celebrating, someone's not celebrating, right? Exactly right. That's very empathetic of you to think of them in that way because, yeah, and as as the boys get older, I'm sure questions are going to be arising that are going to come up around the dinner table or around the, the living room as you, as they ask questions about how all this happened and their family, their birth family and all that kind of, do you, does your book at all help with parents on navigating some of those hard questions at all? It helps in terms of um, explaining how we did it. Okay. Uh, that's a, it's a very personal, um, quite not personal that I don't want to answer it, but yeah. every person is going to be different. Exactly. Uh, so there is a great benefit to staying in touch with birth families. Um, some of some people have open adoptions. Some people have semi-open adoptions where um, the family can get, for instance, for a semi, the family can get pictures, they can get updates, but they don't have contact with the children. An open adoption, they might 
parent the children together. I mean, the adoptive parent, that's the parent. But maybe, you know, birth mom can come for Thanksgiving and dinner or Christmas or whatever, you know. Um, we did not choose an open adoption. That was just the choice based on the case for our boys. Uh, we do stay in touch with the parents anonymously. Um, but it's really because I want to be able to tell my boys, here is how you reach your family. Because they're going to be curious. They're going to want to know it's just a part of being adopted. And as an adoptive mom, I am constantly telling myself when the children are old enough, they will want to know who their mom is, their biological mom. That's just part of trying to find your own identity. So the boys have known that they've been adopted since day one. We talk about adoption, how wonderful it is, uh, that it's such a blessing that uh, one of my boys actually came home from school not long ago and said, hey, you know, Joe was was laughing at me because I'm adopted. And I said, you know what? I said, you go on back and you tell Joe that he's never going to have an experience like you do because you've been specially chosen. I, I, it wasn't that, you know, I had a, a wonderful child and, you know, I chose you. I chose you to be my son. And that is one of the beautiful things about adoption. You don't have to be embarrassed about it because you have been chosen. And so we're very open about it. My husband is uh, is ha Hispanic and I am just Canadian white as can be. And, uh, and, and all four of our boys are Hispanic. So they look like dad, but they look nothing like mom. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point, the question was going to come up, right? So why not just, just be open from the beginning? That was our experience, but not everyone is like that. And so in my writings, I don't give advice on what you should and shouldn't do in those types of very personal choices. But I can explain, here's why we did it, and here's why we think it's beneficial to be open with the children, and here's what you might discover if you are not open with them, because I've read and spoken to a number of people about, I had no idea I was adopted, and now I feel like I don't even have a clue who I am anymore. Yeah. So, so my boys know that when they leave the home here, I will give them all the information I know about their birth family, and they will have what's needed to go find them, to go get to know them. I don't want them to feel like we'll be upset or offended by it because they need to find their own path, too. And a lot of that comes from knowing where you came from. It can even be translated into your visit to your, your doctor. And the doctor's right. like, do you have this in your background? Is this in your medical history? And I think for us having our children that we have, um, you know, that are ours biologically, we have that history that we can share with the doctor. And for others that are adopting or fostering, you don't necessarily have as much detailed information to share with your family doctor. So that's exactly. another whole side of it, too, that would come out in just natural conversation, right? Right. You'd be surprised at how much information that the doctor asks that we have no clue. Wow. No clue. Cool. So as a birth parent, it's a no-brainer. You're filling out your forms. You're, you know everything. You know if, you, if the child was preterm, if they went past term. You know what the labor was like, what the delivery was like. I haven't a clue. I don't know. Um that's not information normally that a foster parent would be given unless there's a severe um, disability that, you know, they, they might have information about it because of that. But And there's a lot of uh, medical practitioners that are like, I, I need to know this. You know, does your family have cancer? Does your family, is there a, a history of diabetes? Is there, I don't know. I, I literally often put X's all over the sheet and just write adopted. Wow. And that's that's the explanation I have to give because I truly don't know what the medical history is of any of my boys. 
So, Lewis, what else is going to be in the book that is going to help parents beyond what we've already covered to that, together? What else can we anticipate as we get this book in the future? Well, it's really going to start at ground zero. Do you want to foster? Yeah. Here's your steps. You know, so I really start at the very beginning about finding an agency, filling out the application. And there's a lot of things to think about, even when you're saying, who do I want the agency to be that's going to represent me as a foster parent? And so I really go through all of that. I love love to talk about our experiences and, you know, when so-and-so crossed the threshold, this, this happened, that happened, what we found on placement day. Here's some great ideas for what to do on day one, especially new foster parents. Let me tell you that very first placement comes in, that very first child you are just knocking your knees together because mm -hmm. you have no idea. But if you realize that the child walking in the door is just as terrified as you are, it right. does make it a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I share a lot of stories about what we did with children because, again, one of the things that stops people from taking the step to be a foster parent is they're like, I don't have a clue what to do, you know? And my answer is, what do you do with your own biological child? Then you do the same thing, yeah. you know? So I talk a lot about, you know, the these things that we do. What do you do on the first weekend? What do you expect in terms of appointments or day-to-day -day things that you'll be going through? A lot of people don't realize that the first time or the first week or two that somebody is placed in your home, they're going to be with you a lot, they, they're not registered in school yet. They're not registered in daycare yet. They, they, a foster parent has a requirement of having certain appointments done by certain days. So somebody who works full time needs to know this before they jump into fostering so that they can have, maybe their village can step up and go, hey, I can, I can care for them or I can take them to this appointment or so all of these are things that I want in my book so that people can be thinking it through. Um, I want educated individuals who know the generalities of what to expect. Uh, every situation will be different. Every child will be different. But what can I expect is going to be expected of me as a foster parent. And I go through each of those things. So it's kind of a roadmap, a roadmap to being a foster parent. Um, adoption, again, very, very, very different. But the main takeaway that I'm hoping my readers will have on this book is, first, anyone who's curious about foster care, I want them to pick up the book and feel like they have been well-educated on the system. Anybody who uh, needs a little bit of encouragement on, hey, is this for me? You know, is this, am I meant to be a foster parent? Let me be your encourager to help you through each step so that you don't feel like you're walking in it blindly and you're walking toward this new um, part of your family that you feel like you have a good handle on what's going to happen. And then thirdly, anybody that does not feel the call to be a foster parent, I've got you in the book too, because I have tons of ideas on how you can support a foster family, support a foster parent, even little tiny things like saying the the words, how can I help you is not going to get answered because it's like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. No, no, no. It's more like saying every Monday night for the next two months, I will be bringing you a hot meal. Nice. Please let me know if there's allergies. Nice. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. People don't think about that. And so I really want to share these ideas. As a mom of four, I drown in laundry. I completely am drowning in yeah. laundry. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for, for a foster parent. Call them up and say, listen, I've got Tuesday afternoons free every week. I don't work. Can I come and help you with laundry? And if they say no, say, okay, I'll be there at 2 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Just go anyway. Just go anyway. They need you. Foster yeah. parents need you. So, so I, I really hope that this is a read that everybody is going to pick up and say, 
interesting because I'm really sharing our life story yeah. with these with these kids. And I'm also sharing the stories of other kids that have come through our home, but then be, been reunified with their families or gone back to, like, sometimes we would take weekend respite. A foster family just is desperate for a break, wants to reconnect with their spouse. Let us take your kids. And we had a little uh, horse ranch. And so we'd bring the kids in, they'd get their first horseback riding lessons. And I um, I share some really special memories from my time of introducing children to horses. And it's amazing that a horse can really reach into the place, into a child's heart, like no human being can. And we had one horse that was a rescue horse. And he, anytime somebody who was hurt or had a disability or was a um, nervous child, he would stand completely still with his head down, just waiting for them to approach him. And it was the most beautiful thing. I, I share the story of Lana in, in my book about a girl who is severely traumatized and how she slowly, 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 one afternoon, let our horse, Indio was his name, let him just really reach into her heart. And it was the first time I saw her smile the whole time she was with us was when she was on horseback and finally decided, I'm going to let him in. I'm going to let him speak to my life. Isn't wow. that amazing? That is amazing? These are the kind of stories that that I that I write, that I share, because these are this is these kids' stories. They need to be heard. They people need to know these are real children. Yeah. It's not just a big, you know, foster care. It no every single one of these are real children with real experiences. And I have the privilege of being there for parts of their life. It yeah. truly is a privilege. It's amazing. And what a great what a great legacy for you and your husband to again open your home, um, oh pour your lives into these great boys for them to have two caring parents that care for them and love them. Like talk about changing the future for these four boys, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to to know where they're gonna end up in life having the two of you there for them that's that's pretty special it's a yeah. it's a special opportunity to be able to do that so for those parents or those soon to be parents or considering to be parents um just want to encourage them through the book and through your story that uh -huh. they they can have a huge impact in someone's life by Absolutely. selfish selfishly uh, you're being selfless and just opening your home to someone like this. This is, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. The biggest, biggest, biggest question I get or comment, it's not even a question. It's a comment is, oh, it's wonderful that you could be a foster parent, but I could never do it because I could never say goodbye to a child that I love. And my response to that is perfect. You are the type of parent they need. Wow. I, I, let it sink. Mm. Let it sink in because yeah. these kids need parents that are going to say, I will love you unabashedly, unashamedly. You have my heart for as long as you are with me. And even longer. You know, if you want to stay in my life, great, great, great. If your parents let let that happen. But these kids need to know that you love them, that you want to bond and be attached to them. And will they hurt when they're taken away? Will you hurt when they're when they're taken away, reunified with their families? Yes, absolutely. There will be pain and you will give yourself time to grieve. And then you'll get back in the saddle and you'll say yes to another set of kids or another child. And it'll go and, and your legacy will just for years and years and years, as long as you let yourself foster, you will be changing the destiny of generation after generation. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, one of my past guests, again, another foster parent, 
they had an emergency foster situation. They had a, a boy come in their home, and he was only there for a short time. He wasn't there for a long time with them. But it was his birthday, the day that he arrived at their house. And the dad found out, jumped in the car, went down to the local store and bought a few presents for this new child in their home and brought it back and they had a birthday celebration and that boy moved on to another situation another home or whatever years later the dad is standing in a store just minding his own business and this tall oh. kid late teens early 20s walks up to him and says you don't know who i am do you and the the father's now looking up at this huge person in front of him and he's like no i'm sorry He's like, I was that kid that you bought those presents for on my birthday. And I want you to know you changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow. Like, he gets in the car and comes home to tell his wife, you know, I just met that boy that we had back in those many years ago. And like, it feels like a fleeting moment to open your house and they come and then they leave. And to your point, you're still going to love them, even after they might leave and move on to a new place. But just the right. power, the impact you can have, because that was that like worked. the only present that boy had in that moment came from that that home, right? So you can have yeah. a huge impact, That's parents. You can yes. do this, right? Yes, absolutely. That's actually one of the uh, services. I can't think of the website right now, but there's a um, company that prepares birthday boxes for kids in foster care. Nice. And um, it's prepared with volunteers who bring gifts, send gifts. And one of my boys had a birthday that while he was still a foster child, and it was an amazing memory. I'm not sure if it was for, for him. It was great for him, but I have kept the box that all of those toys came in because they had wrapped the box in happy birthday wrapping paper. And so my son pulled everything out and I'm like, Th this box is just too precious. So I still have it. It's what I keep all of my candles and stuff like that in. But <laughs> it, it, things like that, that's why I'm saying if you are not called to be a foster parent, there are so many things you can do. Even if you just find the company who does this or I can find it and you can put yeah. it down in the comments yeah. um, and just look at an Amazon wish list and send a bunch of stuff that takes some money, not a lot of time. But you've been a help. Yeah. You have been part of a child's life who is currently traumatized. Yeah. And you've helped them smile, maybe. Yeah. And to the foster parents that are drowning in laundry, please don't be afraid to ask <laughs> for help, too. Like, it's okay. We, yes. Your family and friends, they might not know what to do in the moment, but as soon as they hear, they can help in that way. Please, please ask when you can, because we would love to yeah. support you. Right. And that's something that's also in my book is here's how to ask, you know, here's how to say, listen, um, here are five things that I really need help with. Whether you can do it or not, I just wanted to send out this email or shoot you a text and say, hey, I really need, could use help with this. Yeah. And if they, and if your village does not step up and go, okay, we'll, we'll do it, then, then that's different than you suffering in silence. <laughs> Being just so overloaded and not able to get a moment, so, yeah. so yeah, that kind of thing I, I'm I'm covering as well, so that foster parents really have what they need to go to their community, their churches, their friends, and say, I, I need help, and here's the areas that you can best help me. Excellent. So, Lois, your updated website's coming. Uh, tell us, tell us where we go. We'll have links to this in the show notes. Obviously, people can come and and find you. Right. I, I can imagine you, Lois, speaking to like groups, um, speaking maybe on a Zoom thing, like a, for parents, teaching and, and instructing people and giving them help. There's a lot of people that listen to the show that are looking for people like you with uh, like wisdom and knowledge to share with a group. So there's potential for people to reach out and have you speak for them. How do we connect with you and all that information? Share your website with us as well. Yes, everything funnels through the website. So it is my name which is Lois, L-O-I-S, middle initial J, and last name Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z.com. 
Um, so I do have uh, a free workshop that I'm getting up on the website. It'll be about 30 minutes and it'll be an introductory. Um, if, if you're thinking curious, might foster care might be for you, then this is, this is for you. Um, once you watch that little workshop, if you're thinking, Hey, I want more information, then absolutely reach out. It's again, all through my website, I've got links all over so that you can really, uh, zero in on what you're interested in. And I would love to speak to any groups out there. As you can see, I'm quite passionate about this subject. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) it is. It truly is a work of my heart. I love my boys. I love that we've been grafted together as this very unique family. And yes, I love to speak to other people, whether it be in person. I do go to events if people would like me at an event. Churches I speak to um, and over Zoom, if it's somebody that's too far or doesn't want to fly me in, then absolutely yeah. I'll uh, I'll do some some Zoom sessions as well. So I'm available for that. All of all of that can be booked on my website. I have an option where they can um, go and see me speaking. Um, and uh, so all that's on the website. If you want to connect with me uh, for a speaking engagement, you can do so. I just kind of keep everything uh, on the website. And then from there, you can kind of spider web out to my social channels or YouTube or um, different places where I I, I can, anytime I can get the word out, any way to get the word out. For me, it's it's really about just spreading the word that foster care is not, it's not the big, scary, monstrous system that everybody is afraid of. Yeah. We can all be part of the solution. Excellent. So remind us to when the book is scheduled to come out and come back, please, so that you can we can celebrate yes. the launch of the book. But just give us an yeah. idea what you're thinking. Well, I am hoping that by next year, maybe late next year, okay. um, I'm I'm looking to be traditionally published. So that does take a significant amount of time. If okay. I was being self-published, I could tell you that I'd probably have it out there by next month. Yeah. I just I just want to get it out for people to just say yes, this is for me. Okay. Um, but traditional publishers do take a little bit of extra time. So, so we'll keep. But I do right. share. Yeah. Ex- I share excerpts on my website. Uh, so when you log in, you um, might be one of the first ones to read different chapters or different sections that I like to put out there as teasers. So keep an eye on the website. Definitely keep an eye on the website. Watch for the book launch. Watch for updates and everything as well. Lois, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for opening your home to us as listeners here on the podcast, but opening your home to these boys as well. Thank I you for appreciate being it. My pleasure. Awesome. Hey, thanks for listening all the way to the end of the podcast. That's a big signal to all of the players, the YouTubes, the Apples, the Spotify's that you found value in this episode of Living the Next Chapter. Just by you listening to the end, you just sent a huge bat signal out to the app saying this was a great podcast, a great conversation. So you listening to this point, you've done your job. I have one more ask of you. If you know anyone, anyone that would benefit from this conversation, would you share this episode with them? Would you just get on, send them a message, send them the episode, tell them about this episode, tell them to a living in the next chapter.com to get all the information about the podcast. Can you do that for me? Because the more people that hear this message, this episode, the better. I want to support these amazing authors. And I know you do as well. So sharing this episode really helps. And I appreciate you. See you on the next episode. And thank you for listening to Living the Next Chapter.